And the uh, subject, I'm not sure this, the title of this afternoon discussion is, is fascinating to you all, how to stop talking. That's thinking, how to stop thinking. <clears throat> so this afternoon I can, I've become very uh, astute at this because I could see in the early on in my efforts at meditation how uh, incessant and uh, uh, relentless my thinking process was <clears throat> and because uh, me I started uh, meditating when I was 32 and uh, been through the universities and the graduate school and so forth so I was uh, chock-a-block with ideas thoughts opinions and views <clears throat> And uh, with, and also, you know, with regards to the world, uh, polit politics, uh, religion, Buddhism, you name it, I was, I had an opinion about it. <clears throat> and so, became aware of the, you know, of in the practice of meditation, how just these uh, thinking habits would just keep uh, reoccurring, you know, and disrupting <clears throat> no matter how much I tried to control the mind uh, inevitably I'd end up with this uh, a wandering thinking. There used to be a cartoon in some meditation center with some yogi going to sit down and saying, I'm going to practice meditation and and uh, for to reach a state of inner peace and it shows this figure sitting in full lotus posture and then think think and then think 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 <laughs> and about four or five pictures later it's this think 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 <laughs> the whole body is covered with this word thing and I think we can all relate to that <laughs> as our experience <clears throat> so we are a thinking uh, creature so this is not n not a function of the mind to despise uh, but we become victims of our ability to think and where our education our cultural conditioning everything uh, supports thinking as uh, you know as a praiseworthy uh, function and uh, to not think means uh, implies some kind of stupidity usually but uh, thinking also becomes habitual so then it like any habit <clears throat> it, it's no longer very useful we don't use thought but we become victims of our thinking and so we when we try to meditate then we we want to know how to stop it how can I stop thinking and I remember uh, in the early years of monastic life in Thailand, I remember vividly uh, being uh, at this branch monastery where uh, I'd been living. And it was a beautiful place with a lot of uh, hills and cliffs and grottos. And, uh, you know, I quite, I was very attached, very, I liked the place very much. Uh, but <clears throat> no matter how much I tried to control my thinking it seemed to just uh, be relentless uh, and you know no matter how quiet and and pristine the environment might be or how tranquil external conditions could be my internally my mind was always in this state of of activity and so uh, and just trying to stop thinking was uh, it didn't work either. You know, as I remember determining, I'm going to stop thinking just to, as an act of will, just will myself not to think, and and I'd sit there and uh, and I couldn't uh, do it for very long, and 
So I realized that willpower wasn't what was necessary, wasn't the way to do it, just because there was a desire, uh, there was an insight into the value of not thinking, uh, and, uh, but then how to actually uh, stop thinking or to let the thinking process cease. So like stopping thinking is usually an act of, of will in which we, we're kind of fed up and, uh, with our thinking and we just don't want to think anymore. And so there's a lot of negativity <clears throat> in that when you're just fed up with your mind and you just want to kill it off, not think anymore. That, that, that's a, a negative state. That doesn't work. Just uh, negative desires to try to annihilate thinking. So, the, uh, of course, this brings us to the, the essential point of Buddhist teaching, mindfulness, awareness. <clears throat> and, of course, this is uh, to think about awareness and what is awareness and what is mindfulness. These words uh, translating uh, the Pali word sati sampatanya, sati panya. In, uh, in Pali, of course, is a language that is uh, dedicated to the um, an analysis and understanding of the human uh, conscious experience. And so sati uh, uh, trans generally is translated as mindfulness. But what is that? Mindful of... <laughs> And what is mind? We can't even agree on how we're going to use the English word mind or consciousness. <clears throat> and so heart, you know, when we point to our emotions, we point to the heart. We point, when we, when we uh, think of the mind, we point to the brain. It's got a good mind, meaning it he's, 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 has a good brain. And yet these words are pointing to the reality of, of, of human experience. And so not to let the, the words tangle you up. You, you can never go, you're never going to find uh, words that are totally precise and adequate to describe anything whatsoever. Because life isn't like that. Life isn't dependent on, on words for experience, is it? It's learning to trust in the awakened conscious moment here and now. And so rather than, and that trust is not a, an act of will. You can't order yourself to trust and, and then do that. Uh, you know, it's a good idea and we're all for it, but trust comes, is, is a heartfelt reality, not, not an ideal that we'd like to impose on the moment. So the awakening uh, is the uh, whole essence of the, of the Buddhist teaching. And so as I've said before, the word Buddha means, uh, means awake. And so the, the word itself is, a, is significant and that gives you the whole description of what uh, the Buddhist teaching is, is really. All the volumes that you see in libraries, in uh, internet, in bookshops, <laughs> and uh, what not, uh, uh, in, uh, in all different kinds of languages. Uh, the whole point is a simple uh, uh, encouragement to wake up, be fully present here and now. And so we can understand the, the direction uh, and uh, try to uh, practice that, but then uh, the desire to think about it comes in. We, we, what, is, what am I doing? Am I really here and now? Am I really awake? Uh, we create ourselves endlessly in terms of uh, assuming that we are some kind of real entity from the past. I have a history. Uh, I was born 70 years ago, and I, and I have a birth certificate. Where, and strangely enough, uh, in those days where I'm from, they, they didn't use fingerprints, they used footprint. 
So this right foot that everybody notices, it's so big and swollen, it was only about that big on the... <laughs> so I wasn't born with a big foot. But in terms of reflection, then this awaken here and now, this invitation to awaken, pay attention to life, uh, then, we, then we reflect that this is all there ever is, is a moment here and now. Experience is now, consciousness is now, feeling is now, enlightenment is now. And, uh, and, and thinking arises and ceases according to conditions. So when, when when there's something to think about, and then you know we we apply thought to maybe uh, a particular effort we make in in our profession, or repairing something in the home, or doing something specific. But so much of of our life is caught in just wandering thought, in worry, planning for the future, uh, feeling guilty about the past and on and on like this, so the thinking process overwhelms us. We can, we can be completely unawake in the present just by feeling guilty about something uh, we regret in the past, which is a memory in the present, isn't it? So you, you can uh, become very attached to that memory and then, uh, then spend your time uh, in a state of negative uh, obsession of guilt, remorse, self-aversion, self-condemnation, just because of thinking. If you stop thinking, it would you wouldn't uh, the, the feeling would go away. You perpetuate it by thinking about it. You can think about it in terms of logic and reason, and and an, an, analyze it. You can you can uh, blame yourself, seeing this, uh, that you were very wrong and you were the bad one that did the, said the thing you shouldn't or didn't do the thing you should have. Or you can uh, blame others, somebody else's fault. But all this is still thinking. And, and so thinking needs to be understood, its function, its purpose, uh, and how to use thought, how to use language uh, because it is a valuable tool. It's a great gift. Having a retentive memory, being able to remember, being able to learn, to retain information, to analyze, criticize. Uh, when I'm giving these uh, reflections, it is not a condemnation of this, but recognizing how much suffering we create when we don't understand what we're actually doing when we're lost in, in our own ignorance about thought itself, about uh, emotional habits, uh, the basic delusion we have about ourselves, in ourselves as a kind of permanent person, uh, and th that we ha make value judgments regarding to ourselves. We consider ourselves, you know, in various ways of positive, negative values. So you find in uh, modern affluent societies like this one, uh, there's an enormous amount of suffering around guilt, uh, worry, people are incredibly worried all the time, anxious, frightened, uh, resentful, angry, uh, and because this is all brought about through thinking. <laughs> When you stop thinking, it all drops away, actually. <clears throat> so, <laughs> so how to, how to stop thinking? <laughs> well, if you notice that, um, I think, like uh, Alzheimer's disease, where you lose your memory, uh, I imagine if you lost your total memory, it'd be quite peaceful. In fact, years ago, I met a famous uh, Christian monk in uh, in Berkeley, California, uh, Father B. Griffith, who he was uh, an English uh, monk, Catholic monk, 
and uh, he established uh, an ashram in India. I visited there last last year in uh, in uh, Tamil Nadu, and uh, he, he he was a kind of visionary, kind of a Catholic monk, and he and he was a super brain, super intellectual. He had brilliant mind, very learned, and he also adapted uh, um, Catholic Catholic worship to. Uh, Indian culture. So you go there to Shantivaram, his monastery in uh, Tamil Nadu, and it's, uh, you think you're in a Hindu ashram. <laughs> and the monks wear kind of saffron robes and shaven heads. Thing. <laughs> and I haven't been to Mass for years and years and years. I attended uh, morning Mass, the uh, Eucharist every morning. It's quite beautiful the way they 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 Indianized it. I found, <coughs> but anyway, this uh, Father B. Griffith died many years ago. But before he died, I met him in a Korean Zen center in Berkeley, and uh, and so I wanted to. I heard he was there, and so I went to this place, and they said, "Well, he's he's uh, up in his room, but you can go upstairs and see him." So I went there climbed up the stairs, went into his room there where he's lying in his bed and he was a very beautiful looking old monk actually, he had white beard and very uh, rosy complexion uh, and he looked, you know, he looked very very happy and so he, he called me over to the bedside and he told me that he'd recently suffered a stroke and lost most of his memory and he, and he said what a relief! <laughs> and he looked very, very happy. <laughs> and this shows the man that has contemplated the nature of his mind, because to to most people that would be very frightening, wouldn't it? Be very threatening. You're getting senile, or you're losing your faculties, or you know, it's like a, a disgrace or something terrible happening to you, but. Uh, he didn't see it like that at all, <laughs> and I could understand what he was saying. You know that that actually he was he found a lot more his life more peaceful because he didn't remember so much, and he must you know, and he was incredibly well educated and written, written, had written very scholarly books on religion, theology, and all kinds of subjects. So in uh, meditation techniques, when we're training our mind, when we go through meditation training, we're, we usually, uh, one thing you begin to notice when you start with uh, just watching the breath, uh, what they call anapanasati, mindfulness of the breath, when you're actually with, uh, with concentrated on something physical like the body, you're not thinking. No, you can, when you begin to notice the, just the uh, gentle uh, feeling of the breath at the, at the nostril then, and follow it, inhaling, exhaling, you're actually not thinking. You're, there's awareness, consciousness, awareness. But during that, that moment, we, we tend, the mind tends to wander, so we, we oftentimes, in, in our tradition, we use a mantra to hold the, the, the attention onto the breath, because we're not used to not thinking. And the, the mind easily wanders into some kind of thought. So, uh, we use, the, in the Thai forest tradition, we use the, the Bhutto mantra, uh, which is the Buddha, name of the Buddha. So in Thailand they say, now when you inhale you think to yourself, put, exhale, to. And that's a, a, a technique to help sustain awareness onto the breath for people that uh, cannot stop the thinking process. So then the mantra itself, chanting, mantra, these kind of techniques that you find in, in Buddhism are also ways of, of thinking, but, uh, but concentrating the thought into a, like a, a two-syllable uh, mantra, such as Bhutto, is uh, you're using one word rather than, than thinking about Buddha, 
or um, deciding whether there is a Buddha or not, or whether Buddha is in you or outside. <laughs> Uh, you give up all these kind of uh, uh, questions and uh, que uh, metaphysical speculations to just just use the thinking process to tie it, bind your attention to a simple function, bodily function such as breathing. <coughs> and then they, in the Burmese uh, tradition, Mahasi Sadhu, they usually contemplate the rise and fall of the abdomen. And so they, they don't use butto, they use uh, rising, falling, you know, just to keep the attention on the, on the, when, the, when your abdomen is, is r rising and when it's falling, you, you sustain, that's a way of holding your attention onto it. I also used butto in the, I found that when I first started meditation, I couldn't do anapanasati. I just was such a, uh, an obsessed thinker uh, that I just felt totally frustrated with trying to stay with the breath. So I, I used mantra for the first few months and I found that uh, very significant. Like I, I, uh, this was before I met Lung Po Cha when I was a Samanera in Nongkai. I, um, I had an insight that I needed to let go so I use just those two words, let go, as my mantra. So I couldn't even stay with the breath. So I just uh, decided that I'd use these two words because they meant quite a bit. They, they had kind of important message significant to me at that time. And so I visualize these words just to make it interesting because anything like that can get mechanical and perfunctory. So it, isn't, it doesn't help to just say, let go, let go, and then you get into a perfunctory drone. That's not, that doesn't work either. So the main is to keep your attention fully with the, the mantra. So, so I, I, when you start out, your attention is with it, let go, let go. And, and to keep it from drifting into just uh, mechanical recitation, I would start visualizing, like in neon lights. I'd see see it written in my mind. I'm good at colors. I see colors very well. So I'd make beautiful colors in my mind. With neon, let go. <laughs> and it worked, actually, because I could sustain uh, just by, by uh, keeping it interesting for me, enough to, to where, uh, you know, I was, my attention was totally absorbed into this. Uh, at first I found that I, I just couldn't do it in a kind of n normal rhythm like with the breath. I had to actually uh, think to myself, let go, let go in a very rapid kind of staccato style just because of, of the, the way my mind worked. So I'd say, I'd, I'd in inwardly say I was living alone in a, in a hut, uh, but I would be thinking, I keep this as a kind of high pitch uh, staccato, but fully with the with what I was doing. Eventually, I began to notice that the uh, the wandering tendency started were were lessening, and then I could slow it down, and then eventually I could apply it to to the inhalation exhalation. So this is just a way of, of experimenting. Each one of us has our own peculiarities, and so you have to know how you know, take into account how you, what your obstructions are, where you, where you know, where you, uh, where you need to put your attention, because the things that always work for one aren't may not work in the same way for somebody else. So it's developing upayas or skillful means much of meditation is developing appropriate means uh, at a particular time when you, where the, the main method maybe isn't working or you're really stuck or obstructed in some way, blocked off. So through this uh, letting go practice, uh, 
eventually I'd have long periods where the mind was quite empty. You know, just be, suddenly the, the whole thinking process would stop for a while, there'd be this kind of space. And I'd notice this. Now this is very important to make, to consciously notice non-thinking. So in, in doing this, you, you're, you're, you're trusting in the awareness of the moment, so which is this state of poised attention, attentiveness, uh, here and now, and, uh, and you're, you're observing. You're looking, say, inwardly at this time. You're, you're observing your mind, your mental state. Another method I found very helpful was to notice the, uh, to deliberately think uh, a sentence, but with the attention on the spaces between the words. So I would take some kind of uninteresting sentence, like, I am a human being. And so that, that sentence seems so kind of banal and ordinary, it doesn't interest me particularly uh, in itself, in, its, in the actual words, but I wasn't interested in, in trying to figure out whether, whether I am or not, but just taking a sentence and then, but with the attention before I think it, so I'd, I'd deliberately be thinking. I would, you know, the intention was to deliberately think this one thought. And before I would think it, and there'd be a gap, there'd be, there'd be a hesitation. No thought there. And then I'd deliberately bring I into consciousness, and then there'd be another gap. Am, then there'd be another gap. A, another gap. Human, another gap. Being, and then there's quite a gap after being. <laughs> so, uh, or you could just stop it in mid-sentence. Just because the, the, you're consciously affirming the space between thoughts rather than being fascinated by what you're thinking or just wandering off in habitual ways with the thinking process. And in, uh, in Pali they have a word called papancha, which means uh, conceptual proliferation. And, uh, and so conceptual proliferation sounds uh, uh, doesn't have the same same punch that papancha does. <laughs> <laughs> but in, anyway, it's pointing to uh, habitual thinking. And you notice how, how thinking works. You start with, you, you get caught in, in some, ba some thought, and then it, one thought connects to another. And it goes on. So, I mean, we used to play these games when we were children, party games, where somebody starts out with something, and by the time it gets back to, to the same person, the, the subject that they started with is completely changed. And just uh, it's, uh, remember that of how how papancha uh, just is this. We can start with thinking, well, wh what color should I we paint this room? And then, then um, in five minutes, I'm thinking about uh, you know what uh, what I need to take with me to Bhutan in November. <laughs> <laughs> and no connection, but somehow the mind will wander off like that. So the nature of, of thinking is to wander. So when we say we have a wandering mind, remember that's, that's because of the thinking process. The one thought connects to another and then it stimulates memory or we, we, we feel somehow one thought will bring up some feeling which will, will start thinking in, in that direction. <clears throat> Uh, and so we, we can wander and wander through our whole life in our world of thoughts. So, but the space around thought is, is generally not consciously noted. We don't notice. Not that we don't have it, we never consciously appreciate that. So much of our 
culture is is to think to have think tanks and and to solve every problem through analyzing it and thinking about it so that the modern education is all about uh, thinking developing thought memorizing memory acquiring knowledge where the the aim of Buddhist meditation is almost the reverse is letting go of all that to recognize pure intelligence pure consciousness that isn't conditioned it isn't culturally influenced like consciousness at this moment is not a cultural uh, condition what we put into consciousness can be very cultural personal uh, you know can be right or wrong good or bad high or low <clears throat> but but the actual consciousness that the thoughts arise in uh, is is uh, is not a is not condition. It's natural function. Uh, it's intelligent. It's universally intelligent. So it's not like it's not. You can't claim it on a pers as some kind of personal intelligence. So it's in the, the Buddhist teaching is this awakening. The, through this awakening here and now in the present, we began to recognize or realize what is natural to us within uh, uh, this human form and our conscious reality that we're experiencing here and now. So the um, gaps between thoughts, words, and, and I found that deliberately thinking was was uh, I found that very helpful to me because it made it very clear and very conscious of of the of the emptiness where there's consciousness awareness but non-thought is like in this. so this is a reflection on reality of the moment so you begin to just recognize and consciously notice it's this way, you know, an, an, an emptiness or non-thinking, non-grasping, non-self. There's not a self in it either. As soon as I start thinking about me in some way, then I create myself into consciousness and I become a person, my personality. Then, as a awareness increases I be, I've, I've been teaching this uh, meditation on the sound of silence and um, this I became aware of uh, in the early years when now that I'm thinking now that I'm uh, listening to the sound of silence I hear this uh, so if we could turn off this uh, it's over there somewhere uh, be, right behind. Ah, <laughs> uh, it's going to suck me up into the <laughs> attic. <right? laughs> <clears throat> because as I began to to be more aware, uh, and the awareness increased, then I began to notice this. Uh, resonating um, vibratory uh, is it a sound or what but it it's the in a, it's the background I noticed that when I was actually staying with this just being in this state of awareness that this was very peaceful that um, that the, you know the, the self is gone the uh, the worrying tendencies, the all the willful attempts at meditation dissolve, uh, and all the rest, the, the kind of torture that a monk can make around meditation, about being a monk, uh, and about Buddhism, <laughs> and I mean, because you know, even though you're living, uh, in a, you know, in a good situation, we the tendency is to create problems in the mind, and to the way we hold Buddhist meditation also, it sounds very complicated and difficult. 
there's so many there's so many techniques and methods and and the teachers and so forth so that we we you know when we read a lot and and try to figure out how to meditate according to often scriptural authority or commentaries uh, you know you end up with a feeling I don't, I don't think I'll ever be able to do that uh, because it, you know, the, the thinking process makes, is, a, is one that complicates. Meditation is ultimate simplicity. So the more we try to, uh, you know, talk about meditation and describe it, then it becomes increasingly more complicated. And so the, that's why meditation retreats or workshops and that are, attempts to, not to, to discuss meditation, but to actually practice it, to give uh, occasions where you can actually uh, be supported in just being with yourself for a few minutes and looking inward, beginning to get that message of, of noticing, of awakened awareness, where you, you, you're not just perpetuating the old habits of thinking and analysis. So when I, uh, anyway during that time I, I did notice this in uh, this sound of silence and uh, I didn't know what it was, it didn't, nobody seemed, it wasn't particularly a subject that was mentioned in Buddhist uh, texts so uh, but I did, oh, I was aware that when I'm in this state, it's, uh, there is no self. And previously, when I was 19 years old, uh, I did have a kind of mystical experience when, when uh, my mind actually, the thinking mind just packed up all of a sudden. Uh, it wasn't due to drugs or anything, it was natural uh, occurrence in a Christian monastery in California. So, uh, so just suddenly the whole, when you're 19 years old, you know, you're, it's a very painful time for a young man because you're, you're so self-conscious and, and you're not really adult yet. And yet I was in the military and I was in the Navy at the time and there was so much kind of things going on and pressures on to me, and and lack of confidence, and this this endless self-critical tendency. It and it suddenly it dropped. And then I was completely and with this kind of resonating kind of sound, and uh, I thought oh, I'd like to be like this all the time. And this is very really nice, not beat anybody. You know, and suddenly being 19 years old, being in the Navy, and uh, being self-conscious, all of that completely vanished. And of course it was a, a timeless experience. I don't know how long it was, because it was timeless. But eventually I had to go back to the uh, naval base, and uh, then of course the old, old uh, habits came back with a vengeance, and I didn't know what had happened. <clears throat> but it did, uh, I, I consider that an awakening experience actually because uh, two years later I came across uh, Buddhism and something in me, you know, immediately kind of understood Buddhism in a way, you know, not in intellectually but uh, uh, intuitively. So I've pursued that ever since as a Buddhist path. But they, then in, uh, when I, the first year living in, uh, in the UK, 1977, we lived in, in Hampstead, near Hampstead Heath in London. And this was a very difficult year, because coming out of the Northeast Thai forests, uh, and to live in this huge European city, <laughs> in a townhouse, and uh, the future was very, and everything had changed. I'd become accustomed to the ways of doing everything in Thailand, and then suddenly I'm in a very modern uh, city, and uh, one of the biggest in the world, and uh, I used to get a bit terrified going on the underground. I mean, when I'm going down the Hampstead 
uh, underground station, it's you have to go down and down like you're going into hell. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and all these crowds of people going to get on these trains. I remember being quite quite frightened by by the uh, activity. And it was there. And then I was walking down Haverstock Hill where the Vihara was one afternoon, and suddenly the sound of silence. Suddenly, it, it stopped me, like it attacked me. I was attacked by it. And <laughs> I was nonplussed, you know, so suddenly I remembered this. And uh, it's very interesting how one's spiritual life develops because uh, at the time that I came to live in, in England was, it seemed to me this emptiness was, was becoming stronger, uh, you know, practice. It was very strong, but uh, living in Thailand, living in the, in the tropical uh, climates, they're very noisy. So you've always got <laughs> and living in in jungles, and there's always insects and things buzzing, and and uh, so you you uh, you you have this incessant kind of background noise from from the insect world. But in uh, London, you know, in in winter time, it's very very still. And so I began to really appreciate the, the, the stillness. And even though uh, people think London is very noisy, Ajahn Chah himself said, this is a very quiet city. Because before, the week before we came here, we'd been in Bangkok, which is a very noisy city. <laughs> And for one thing, either it being uh, so far north, it isn't. There's not. It, it, it's not. Uh, there's a lot of natural stillness and silence here. And uh, last year, when I went up to the North Pole, I was. Uh, I've always had this kind of. Uh, the, it started back in 1977 in Hampstead, having this kind of uh, wish to go up and live on, in the, at the North Pole, or at least visit. <laughs> <laughs> and and so somebody, a uh, friend of mine, Richard Smith, made this possible. We spent a week there in, in Svalbard, this island north of Norway. Uh, but also it was quite, quite uh, just, uh, you know, because it is so still and silent you know, the f further north you go into the Arctic. But this stillness is innate with us. I mean, it's, if we have to go up and live at Svalbard, then that that would be one thing. But uh, not many people would be willing to do that, <laughs> or could do it. But uh, to find that within you, isn't it? That's the whole uh, thrust of the Buddhist teaching, to find that uh, unshakable stillness here and now, not not depending on... Uh, external conditions. Like if I had to find it you know, every, every time I had to be still, I had to go to Svalbard, then that would... <laughs> I'd somehow think, oh, this isn't quite right, you know. Buddha said nothing about Svalbard in the scripture. <laughs> and I didn't know anything about it either for most of my life. But... Uh, but this stillness then is is uh, what I call the sound of silence. So uh, as you pay attention you know, to to recognize this sound of silence, uh, it's it's in a relaxed state. You know, like people looking for they think it's some super cosmic vibration, and they try to find it. So I've had people on retreats with me when I talk about sound of silence, and they're very much. Uh, trying to find it, you know, and so they they, they desperately stood there trying to find it, and because they conceived it as some kind of esoteric sound, uh, and they don't see themselves; they see themselves as somebody that that doesn't have it, and that they and they've got to find it. So just the word "sound" itself is quite misleading, because there's a little sound, you know, sounds come and go. 
and uh, and depend on conditions. But this is a con continuity. This is like a stream. It has a stream-like quality. It has a continuity. If the kind of naturally high pitch, uh, almost uh, electric, can be quite electric, and uh, has a kind of vibrate, vibrates, scintillates. Um, some people, you know, how you want to look at it. Some people call it a buzz, which gives it a kind of like it's irritating. Buzzes is usually an irritation, scintillating, sound of of uh, the stars, and that makes it ethereal. You know, so I mean, how you want to describe it, <laughs> uh, make it very kind of coarse and and irritating or sublime. <coughs> So, I've uh, I pres uh, I found it very uh, sublime, actually, uh, and and it's a con con it has a continuity uh, all the time. It's present, but wh whether I'm aware of it or not is something else. So, in terms of a, an object of meditation, to to recognize this is to to open yourself to it. So the attitude towards this kind of practice is not concentrating the mind on something, but on relaxing the sense of inner ease, of just being yourself, relaxed, open, and receptive. So sometimes in meditation techniques, they're highly developed on the level of concentration. So you see people going in, sitting on the floor, going in, uh, sitting on the zafu, and then they go like this. You know, because uh, they, they're trying to concentrate the mind and shut everything out. To concentrate, no, you have to focus on one thing and shut everything else off. So you absorb into the object you're concentrating on. In order to do that, you have to reject all other impingement shut it away from you. But this is a real mindfulness style because it's a, it's a different kind of concentration. It's not focused on one point uh, that you're, you're trying to absorb into uh, by excluding everything else. It's opening to the totality of this moment. And so that that is a kind of formless reality. It has there's no form to it, where concentration practices, samadhi practices are always, you know, on an object of form, something uh, that you've, you know, you've been given or chosen to focus your attention upon. So, in this, this way, is, is relaxed, it's like relaxed attention, open, receptive, here and now. So it's like you're in a state, I like to describe it like this, wide open, rather than focused on an object. And then you're, you're in a state of relaxed attention. You're not trying to become somebody who, who's relaxed. You know, you're not trying to, it's not a relaxation exercise. It's more of a, a, a suggestion, a gentle suggestion, rather than an imperative. So you, in this, you know, being just who you are in the present, open, receptive to whatever. And so your your awareness then, in, in with consciousness, can pick up, can begin to notice this this uh, vibration. It's quite ordinary. It's not not like some esoteric uh, vibration from the heavenly realms that only the very gifted can get. <laughs> and if you see it like that, then you, you, you know, you'll give up. So, what I'm trying to point <laughs> unless you very kind of have a, uh, or, you know, you have an inflated ego and see yourself <laughs> self as being a very special uh, creature. So, the uh, Recognizing this, then it's uh, because it is a receptive state. Uh, 
it's not analytical, you know, so it's, uh, it's where we begin, what I call the gate to the deathless. Now, this means a lot to me because usually when I give formal talks, I usually chant this, uh, Aparuta Ne Sangamantasatavara, the Buddha announced the gate to the deathless are open. And so this is, this is very powerful, uh, chant to me because it's, uh, you know, the Buddha made this there, the gate to the deathless. And of course they, these are metaphors, this is language again, but but the gate to the deathless, what is it? You know, is it, is it some kind of thing only the Buddha 2,500 years ago recognized? Or it was, it was more like, to me it was like a proclamation, you know, it wasn't, uh, I'm I've found the gate to the deathless in the, because I'm so special. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, here it is you know, for for everybody. It's a proclamation to the world. So then, that that gate to the deathless, the deathless then uh, is you know when you see what is death is all about your thinking, identity with your body, uh, with your emotional habits with all your attachments, isn't it? Your, the fear of losing your loved ones, uh, getting old, getting ill, uh, dying, uh, you know, the, the worry about the future, the regret about the past, all this comes through thought and through identity, through ignorance of Dhamma or the deathless reality, we are bound into the, to the death-bound condition. So this is why it is so frightening for us and why we worry and are anxious because we're actually identifying with things that are going to fail us or disappoint us, that we're going to have to separate from anyway, that, that uh, you know, we invest so much of our attention uh, in and then it, 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 uh, at the end of the day it's disappointing, it's worthless. So we can become cynics, or we just try to, or we take to drink, because <laughs> forget about it all. Or we become meditators. <laughs> and this is a much more skillful way, uh, I guarantee, than, than the others. Um, so this deathless is, uh, then I connect this, this uh, sound of silence, the sign of the deathless. Now I'm not making doctrinal statements, but this is just a way of reflecting on experience. Uh, so so uh, what I'm saying is for reflection is not a kind of Ajahn Sumedho dogma or doctrine. And I think it's more annoying than, than, than people uh, making uh, making some kind of cult out of what I'm saying, because that's not what I'm trying to do. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm just trying to awaken you and point to obvious to to that which is quite obvious that we tend to ignore and not notice. So then, training myself, I um, begin to notice that. That wherever I was, even in in the Thai jungle and the Thai forest, and when I was really aware, I could hear the sound of silence, the insect sounds, uh, the noise of, of radios or things like that were not, you know, obstructions to it. I noticed very strongly how when one is by um, waterfalls or current streams or rivers, the sound of flowing water. Uh, the sound of silence is even the more stronger. You know, it emphasizes. I give retreat in Chiang Mai every year near a waterfall. It's a terribly loud sound. This waterfall is a big waterfall, makes a lot of noise, and yet sound of silence is is very much, uh, you know, there. It's not the the sound of the waterfall does not diminish the sound of silence. So this this pointing to to, that it, to, to it's something we can rest in and relate to all the time, 
wherever we are, whatever situation we're in. Like right now, sitting here in front of you, I can, I'm fully aware of this sound of silence. I don't have to ask you to go out of the room. And I don't even have to stop talking <laughs> or thinking. If I pay attention, it's there. It's here, here and now. So just by noticing this, by awakening to these realities, he began to develop the wisdom faculty, or panya. Now, in panya, in Buddhist terms, is not, it's not, uh, it's the difference between, like, we're trying to be critical through thinking, through logic and reason, reasoning. We, we know that what's good, what's bad, what's better, and what's the best, and what's worse and worst, and we know this one something's right, something wrong, uh, male and female, day and night, um, all the dualisms of thought, and we have various uh, preferences on this spectrum of dualism uh, that we get very attached to. But, uh, and, but wisdom in the word panya this Pali word panya is, uh, is discernment. It's not a critical function. Now, what, when I discern this moment, then using the discerning ability, using the panya, sati panya, this moment, there's awareness of the way it is. It's discerning. It's fully present. Now, so it's not dismissing anything or any detail or by putting any kind of judgment upon it as being trivial or banal or stupid or important or whatever. It recognizes, it can discern, but it's not critical. As soon as I start criticizing, then I'm back into thinking again. That this should be, that shouldn't be, this is better than that. So in this state of this this natural state of discerning, then the, the awareness opens us to, it's a gate to the death, this opens us to the deathless reality uh, of, through awareness, to be aware of the nature of the conditioned realm, which is changing, in that all conditions are impermanent, they arise and cease. So this discerning change uh, is not judging it as something good or bad, it's just the way it is. When we see and really recognize the condition realm, the conditions that we're experiencing, both the bodies and the motions, thoughts, this, uh, then we're seeing them in perspective, not from attachment, not from preference, or cultural biases, or anything like that. We're, we're beyond that. We're coming from the panya, or the wisdom faculty. So then uh, we, we see uh, that all conditions are impermanent. So this is not just a, something we project on to conditions, but discerning the reality of change in terms of experience here and now. And that unshakable awareness then, as you trust yourself to rest in this awakened, natural awakened state of being here and now, you find your strength in that awareness. No, no longer do you find yourself caught up in the endless, endless uh, attachments and judgments and that around the conditions you're experiencing. You 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 can respond. You can act with spontaneity, but. It, your relationship to it has changed from personal identity to one of wisdom, understanding the Buddha, in, in terms of Buddhist terms, the Buddha uh, knowing the Dhamma, or the truth of the way it is. So these are uh, just uh, ways that I've, I've found helpful uh, to me in my practice. And the, uh, I know that, that uh, 
you know, if one of, if one uh, you know, the basic delusion is I am this person, I'm this body. And, and as long as my meditation practice operates from this assumption, uh, then I, I never break through it. I'm stuck. Uh, with you know, with the with the habits of I am this person who has to practice in order to become enlightened. So I've been encouraging people to begin to recognize even the assumption I am this person. I am Ajahn Sumato. This is this is a creation in the present, and uh, and I am unenlightened, and I need to practice so that I become enlightened. This is about time. This is about me being a person because my personality is not enlightened. Is it? I have an enlightened personality. <laughs> it's pretty much the same as it was. I think a little better. But uh, the personality, uh, you know, is a habit formation. So it's not a matter of, of suddenly I'm, I, you know, I'm, uh, I become an enlightened person. But there is enlightenment. There is, as more you trust in the awareness, that is the gate to the deathless. That is the ultimate truth. That is the, where you you recognize that re, recognize ultimate reality or reality itself. And that's what you really are, you know. That's your true nature. It's uh, Lung Pa Cha called it going home. You're, you know, it's, your, it's a natural state, and it's not mine. It doesn't belong to any religion even. It's not, nobody can put their label on it and claim it. Uh, and so it's not a matter of, of, a, of, of willfully trying to get it or become it, but in letting go of these of the delusions of self to recognize, to awaken to the Dhamma, to see it and know it for yourself.